I couldn't have been more than four or five, and my grandfather didn't want me in the saloon. He gave me a small mug of beer with a big collar with a big collar on it. I had four or five pretzels, and he said, "Go outside and sit on the curb and enjoy yourself." So I'm out there on the curb drinking this beer and eating pretzels when the Salvation Army band shows up. When they're praying, well, they're praying all kinds of psalms in front of me and praying for my salvation. They must have been shocked to see this kid drinking beer. I remember yelling up to my grandfather, There's a big band down here! The little girl with the Buster Brown haircut had a front row seat of life unvarnished. At the corner of Liberty and 11th Streets, she observed the people and the ways of the world, not all of them as benign as the passing Salvation Army band. On her curbside outings, she would converse with prostitutes, members of the mob, men returning from, returning from the mills, Mamouche, an Italian woman who roamed the streets, praying, and the black people who shared her neighborhood. This moving carousel of humanity would instill within the child an empathy for strangers and teach her to relate easily with individuals from disparate backgrounds. In this, la in this laboratory of life, young Rita absorb the misery of the world and the hidden humor few ever managed to find. About this time, May Rizzo set up a dry cleaning shop next to her father's saloon after a brief apprenticeship with a tailor and cleaner. It would be the first of many entrepreneurial efforts she undertook to provide for Rita without family assistance. If she had to live beneath her parents' roof, May was determined to show them she could support her daughter alone. May demonstrated the same independent streak in matters of faith, though the G. and Francesco clan were not churchgoers. May began frequenting St. Anthony's. The church and its pastor, Father Joseph Riccardi, gave the abandoned wife a sense of comfort and peace. As a volunteer, she organized Italian festivals in the parish. One of these would provide the setting for Rita, Rizzo, Rita Rizzo's first public performance. A couple of years after Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer took the country by storm in 1927, Rita impersonated him on stage. Wearing a little boy suit, the six-year-old walked into the crowded church hall to sing Danny Boy. The stage looked gigantic to me. My mother was petrified, so she says, Look, I'm going to be right there in the audience, so you keep your eyes on me and you'll be okay. You just sing your song, okay? I said, okay and all of a sudden my uncle pushes me out. The big curtains part, and there I am. So I start singing the song, and just at the place where Al Jolson begins to cry because Danny Boy dies, I couldn't find my mother. Someone must have stepped in front of her, so I'm crying my eyes out. I keep singing, but I'm crying like a baby, and I'm going, oh Danny Boy. Pretty soon, the whole place is crying. Then suddenly I see my mother, and I'm all happy again, singing away. It was perfect. My Uncle Nick went bananas. He picked me up and threw me in the air, and the people were yelling and clapping. Even at a tender age, Rita would draw a claim, not so much for her performance as for her ability to display honest emotions in public. The audience connected with the basic humanity they saw coming from the child and responded with their love. This momentary joy would not last long, however. In the late 1920s, the Black Hand unleashed a renewed campaign of fear and violence in Canton. Their wicked spree went largely unchallenged by the Canton police, who were complicit in their crimes. Excuse me. In one of the most notorious murders of the era, Don Mellet, the crusading publisher of the Canton Daily News, was gunned down in his garage after writing a series of articles exposing bootleg operations and prostitution rackets in town. Canton's police chief, Serenus Len Lengel, a detective, and others were later convicted of the murder. Lacking confidence in law enforcement, Rita, May, and many of their neighbors turned to the only stable institution available to them, the Catholic Church, which was relatively strong in Canton and an active force in the lives of parishioners. In a story related by Mother Angelica, her mother and some, and some locals, Father Joseph Riccardi, discovered that the mob was burying bootleg liquor in a place beyond suspicion, St. Anthony's School, schoolyard. The, local, the locals served the double purpose of providing the mob with a great cover for their illegal hooch, as well as a way to humiliate the straight arrow priest. Standing his ground in defiance of a death threat, Father Riccardi 
installed floodlights in the schoolyard and alerted lo local authorities. Someone should have told the 32-year-old priest that the authorities were on the mobster's payroll. But it was Father Riccardi's announcement that St. Anthony's would be relocated from the heart of Mafia territory to the comparatively tranquil 11th Street, Southeast, S.E., that really drew the ire of the Black Hand. The church provided her the church provided their neighborhood and the businesses with a cloak of respectability. It also may have been a useful meeting place to conduct affairs in relative secrecy. Whatever their motive, the mob was dead set against whatever their motive, the mob was dead set against the relocation, preferring to have the new church built on Liberty Street in place of the old one. Coerced parishioners petitioned the court for an injunction, which halted building at the 11th Street site for a time. Eventually, Riccardi prevailed, and a new St. Anthony sprang up in a better part of southeast Canton. Bishop Schrems, the ordinary of Cleveland, sang the young priest's praises. Father Riccardi was fighting for the upbuilding of a decent, clean-living clean, clean living Italian colony, free from the influence of gambling resorts, bootlegging joints, and infamous houses which infested the neighborhood of the old church site.